Okay, so uh, yeah, the recording is in progress. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very proud to host uh, Surf Labs today. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Saurabh Suryavanshi, who is the principal research engineer and the lead development quantum at, uh, lead development engineer at the quantum adjacent memory at Surf Labs. So before Surf Labs, he worked in ARM research on novel memory technologies and uh, he completed his PhD and MS at Stanford University and his BTEC and MTech from IIT Bombay, all in the field of microelectronics. His PhD was at the intersection of nanoelectronics, semiconductor physics, and fundamental material science. Uh, along the way, he has also interned at Sandusk and uh, CLAT. Um, he's extremely passionate about computing and its effects on human life. With that, I will now hand it over to Saurabh. All right, thank you, Shreyas. Um, hey guys, uh, my name is Saurabh. Um, I talked to a bunch of people just now, but just curious, is there anyone from semiconductor background here, devices, circuits, hardware? Um, yeah, you can just put it in chat or um, just, just trying to understand my audience here. Um, so my name is Saurabh and I, as, I, as Shreyas mentioned, I currently work at Surf Labs. We are actually based in Austin. I'm based in California, but our headquarters is in Austin. Um, our CTO, Greg Eric, um, and CEO, most of the uh, CEO, Eric Hennenhofer, are both based in um, Austin. Greg is actually an alumnus of UT Austin, so he was very happy that I'm giving talk to you guys. He did his bachelor's, master's, um, and PhD, all in semiconductors in UT Austin. Um, and I think he mentioned that Ben Streetman uh, was one of his uh, PhD advisor. And Anand Balpurkar was um, his uh, lab mate. So he, he's very happy that this is happening. Um, he gave me a very interesting anecdote before I, um, uh, I came here was that his uh, daughter recently graduated from electrical engineering in UT Austin and her boyfriend was also there. And they were very adamant that they didn't want to be part of semiconductor industry. But when they actually started looking for jobs, both of them ended up being in semiconductors. So they just started working in two different industries in semiconductors. Um, that kind of ties in this talk very well uh, because I wanna talk about um, semiconductor, give like a brief idea about what really this market is all about um, and how the innovation, if at all, happens in this semiconductor industry. Um, this could be interactive, please feel, I don't really see where the chat is right now, but if you want to just pause uh, me during the presentation, that's fine too, um, because you might have a different background and that's completely okay. Um, if you want very clarification, if not, then we'll take the questions at the end. So I want to start with what's happening around this. And I think that really ties down into what might happen into the future. So COVID really disrupted a lot of supply chain and semiconductor being one of them. Um, in fact, semiconductor is really, really dependent on supply chain because there are tens of, or maybe more dozens of uh, countries that come together to make a single chip. Um, and then supply chain is affecting a lot of other things. Um, and if you try to buy a car recently, you can see like you have to pay extremely high premium um, to buy a car because there is significant shortage in the auto industry and to an extent that it's supposed to affect $200 billion in revenue just in 2021. The other aspect is, of course, um, because uh, the supply chain is so critical for semiconductors, any major event in the world affects the semiconductor production and it can potentially lead to serious conflict. So it, like, it, it is becoming a geopolitic and strategic importance to have very strong hold on your semiconductor manufacturing. And the companies, the, the countries have rightly identified that um, a lot of countries are coming and figuring out like, hey, semiconductor is essential for us. And nowadays, um, the infrastructure, when we talk about infrastructure, we also talk about broadband, we also talk about um, cyber infrastructure. And you can't really depend on other countries just to have your country's very critical infrastructure, as well as defense uh, needs. So the US uh, House recently announced like a 52 billion uh, investment um, in semiconductor, primarily to bring the manufacturing back to the US. And US is not alone. Um, India, China, and EU are spending billions of dollars to make sure that they are, to, to an extent, self-reliant in terms of semiconductor. 
Um, and that is what, ha what happened recently two years. But in the long run, we are increasingly depending on semiconductor for all of our needs. Uh, we talk about automation. We talk about, um, you know, like uh, uh, it, putting intelligence in everything that we have, your toothbrush and whatnot. And that is going to cause a lot of use of semiconductors um, and the use is going to go, grow on exponentially. But at the same time, we also need to understand how that's going to affect us. So by 2030, the 20% of total energy consumption is going to come from semiconductor related information technology. And if you look at the graph, it's actually growing exponentially. So the more we rely on semiconductor, the more we're going to use them and the more the energy demand is going to come from semiconductor. Um, and at the same time, the data economy is not slowing down. Um, you can see that the number of mobile users are going to plateau because there are so, just so many people in this world, but every individual is consuming more and more data. And the data causes use of resources. It causes use of energy. And that is sort of like a feedback cycle. And the trend is not good. We want to see cat videos every day, every time. Um, and just a statistic that 600 hours of videos are uploaded on YouTube every minute. And I'm just talking about one platform. There are so many platforms out there. And it affects, and each video watched is sort of like energy consumed. And that's not gonna stop. If you look at what is happening in the data world, uh, the consumption of data is gonna increase further. Uh, we want better video resolution. We want better cameras. Um, and the recent cameras from Samsung have incredibly high resolution, which means that the photos you're gonna upload are gonna, high, uh, are gonna need a lot of uh, uh, memory and indirectly uh, a lot more energy consumption. Um, you can say that the energy consumption can potentially reduce, but we are on, on our way to use 10 trillion chips by 2040. And even if one chip consumes a milliwatt of power, that's like significant part of uh, global energy production. But unfortunately, the energy is also increasing in the chips. So we are making chips that are more and more power hungry. Um, they're gonna consume more and more power. So there is an economic aspect. There is definitely a talk about national security and stuff, but I really think that we need to put like the environment in perspective and how our semiconductor is gonna affect. But at the end of the day, it really matters what is happening on the economic side of things. So a smaller transistor does help you to save power, but what is happening is very interesting. Um, so, so far, like last few decades, the cost of making a single transistor was exponentially reducing, but something interesting happened last 10 years. The cost actually flattened and it has started to increase. Uh, partly because it's getting more complicated to make smaller transistors. Um, we went to this, uh, three-dimensional transistor where the etching and other kind of uh, resources required for production are costlier. So it is it doesn't really make sense to go on smaller and smaller transistor to reduce the power consumption. Even if I give you a lot of money and I'm, I said like, hey, I don't care about money, just make a transistor that is super efficient. Um, that may not hold true because on the left side, what I'm showing is switching energy trends over the last 50 years. And initially they were exponentially reducing. Every switch was getting better and more efficient and smaller every few years. But now we are reaching this limit where we are not that far away from like a fundamental limit. Now you can call this as a Shannon's limit or the, some people call it the Landar limit, but essentially we are a few orders of magnitude away from that limit. Um, we need the switch. We need the transistor as a switch primarily because all our computing is based on what is known as von Neumann architecture. So in von Neumann architecture, what he proposed was that you have a central processing unit on one side and memory unit on the other side, and you store your program and your data on the memory unit, and they sort of like communicate between each other. Um, and then that's where the switch comes into picture to enable that sort of communication and doing the calculation on the CPU side. So it's not really, feasible uh, to go in this path to make transistors smaller and smaller, both from economy, both from climate, uh, but there is need. There is need of exponential growth in semiconducting power um, for so many things that we cannot survive without. And this is not the first time. Uh, this has happened multiple times and we innovated. Um, so computing industry goes back to 1900s when there were electromechanical switches, then there were relays, vacuum tubes, 
and what the invention of BJT is really what made made this really fast growth industry. But even with BJT in like around um, 70s, uh, the power consumption was incredibly high because BJTs need larger uh, currents. So we moved on to CMOS and we are facing similar problem. So what does that mean? Do we go and find a new switch or do we completely change the one nine one computing paradigm? Um, and whatever happens, no one can predict. And it really depends on various factors that I'll go over. Um, and it's worth thinking about this because this sort of affects our career growth, my career growth and your career growth in next 10, 20, 30 years. But most likely what's gonna happen is that this is gonna be a much more gradual change. Um, by gradual change, what I really mean is that when we look at the semiconductor development uh, or semiconductor industry, there are various levels of abstraction. Um, uh, when I talk about transistor, I'm mostly talking about like lower two levels, physics and devices, but then there are so many levels up above that, including hardware and software. So before 10, 15 years, uh, transistors were getting better and better. So it was not really economical to really invest in a lot of these other layers of the stack. Uh, but now that transistor have stopped scaling, uh, it makes sense to go out and see where are the low hanging fruits, um, which are now commercially viable. And people have started harvesting these fruits. So initially people started doing parallel competition uh, because uh, on the left side, you see that the um, the single thread performance stopped to reduce around 2010. So we started increasing the number of cores. Um, and now the, you can find some server application which have 64 cores or even hundreds of cores. Uh, but there is a limit because to when you have parallel competition, you want to reduce your problem into smaller units and then stitch that problem together. And there comes a point when uh, adding a number of cores does not really help the scaling. But that's going to continue at least for near future. There are application specific compute. Um, when you are only doing one specific compute, such as tensor multiplication, you don't really need a general purpose framework. Um, and it's a, uh, this kind of compute is actually kind of targeting the, the abstraction stack too. So if you look at the center figure, the abstraction stack for application specific compute is slightly different. Uh, because you don't need this fine grain abstraction. You can sort of combine a bunch of layer, layers together and move fast. Um, and it helped initially. Uh, you can see a lot more uh, applications coming out of Google, Facebook, Amazon, where you start to see more and more uh, application-specific compute. But th there have been studies which show that eventually, if you don't really increase the number of transistor on chip, the, the performance gain is uh, going to plateau. So it will work in the near term, but not like a future uh, technology development. And the other aspect happening is uh, packaging. Um, so people are trying to figure out how we can leverage uh, technology for what it is good for. So for example, if you want to use um, gallium nitride, which is really good for high power uh, applications and CMOS, which is good for very uh, low power application, can we combine them on the single chip? Um, or can we combine memory and uh, processing on a single chip? Um, and that will help you to gain performance benefits because now you don't really have to rely on one technology um, to answer all the questions. So you can choose a technology for a specific need and then combine this technology in a heterogeneous fashion. In fact, some of the new coming application also have photonics on chip for communication. Uh, because light is faster than electrons. So you can communicate faster using light. Um, and having a very advanced packaging allows you to put a lot of chips on, on a single wafer. And this is something that I started appreciating even more now uh, because I feel some of these things are not really part of like curriculum. Uh, no one really talks about packaging, for example, but it's, it's something that you guys should be aware of as a very viable job prospect. And I mostly talk about like what might happen in the future, but one of the options is that uh, a lot of challenges right now are coming because of the data heavy applications. And uh, if you remember the one Neumann diagram that I showed where you had logic and memory, 
um, a significant part of the data heavy applications such as deep learning and stuff uh, use a significant energy and uh, performance uh, just to shift the data from one point to another point. So the top uh, kind of cartoon on the on the right side um, shows that you, the your central processing unit gets the data from the data and then does, does some computation and sends the data back. It made sense when you are talking about kilobits of programming code, but when you're talking about gigabits of your videos and photos, um, it doesn't make sense to transfer that data uh, back and forth uh, across this uh, highway. Um, so one option is to bring memory closer to the compute and we can leverage the, the benefit of uh, packaging. So on the left side, there is actually a product from Samsung where they tried um, to put processing very close to the memory. Uh, but on the other side, you can also bring processing inside the memory itself. So you can use a lot of computation inside the memory and that will help you to give benefits in the near term. But I, I feel that these are um, sort of optimization for the near term. It doesn't really address what's gonna happen in the long term. Uh, by long term, I'm talking about 10, 20 years. So there is a lot of research going on to understand what is the future of computing. Um, and we are not really clear if it's gonna be von Neumann or something different. Um, you might hear about neuromorphic computing where the researcher are building um, chips, sometimes based on silicon, sometimes based on new materials to perform or mimic brain activities in terms of neuromorphic compute. There is a lot of discussion on photonics compute using light because light is faster and um, much, much better in terms of the energy efficiency or some very advanced compute such as probabilistic compute or quantum computing. And there are many other emerging technology. This is just an example. So I, I hope that gives you sort of an understanding of where this field is moving. But in reality, if you want to make something sustainable, you want to sort of bridge these requirements. You want to understand what is required now and what is required in the future. Um, so some of the observation that I made during my PhD was that there is definitely growing demand for memory. Um, the competition is likely going to move closer to the memory. Uh, energy consumption is a big problem in semiconductor and almost 50% of energy consumption comes from memory or even more in some cases. And most likely we will have to move from the current physics to something different, some similar to what we did from BJT to CMOS. Um, and I, I, I look for jobs and I ended up at ARM looking at memory technology where they were already working on CRAM, uh, which is a disruptive new memory technology with new materials and new physics. It is a very simple device. Uh, it has only three layers, one bottom electrode, there is our material, and um, then we have a top electrode. But I'll go through why this is interesting. And part of it is the physics behind it. So we believe that CRAM op uh, operates by what we call as correlated electron physics. Now in traditional semiconductors, um, if you go back to your like, you know, electronics 101 or a semiconductor physics 101, uh, you might remember that um, silicon has these two bands. One is the valence band, one is the conduction band. And when your Fermi level is in between these bands, you end up turning the, the device off. And what we do for silicon is that we apply some voltage on the gate. We push that Fermi level either into the valence band or into the conduction band. And that's how you start the transistor to conduct and we get an on state. But correlated electron material behave uh, differently. Um, instead of moving the Fermi level, they actually change the band structure. Uh, I can go into detail this later on after the talk, but essentially what you need is very narrow band. Uh, which is shown here, uh, and the Fermi level just stays there. And you can change the band, split the band, and make the uh, device turn into on and off state. And that has a uh, potential benefit in terms of the speed of the switching, in terms of the energy required to switch. We are doing very fundamental research too, trying to understand what is happening inside these materials. Um, so I won't go into the details on the right side, but essentially what he shows that it gives us insight into what is the band structure of this material and how narrow of the band are we containing our Fermi level inside. So that gives us a lot of benefits. 
but we are CRAM is not the only memory out there. There are a lot of emerging memory. Um, for example, there you might have heard about resistive RAM memories, which is essentially operated by the filaments. Uh, from top electrode to bottom electrode. We also have uh, phase change memories. Uh, Intel has a product out there on phase change memories and there is MRAM. Uh, but they started as general purpose memories but ended up with some kind of uh, non-idealities. So these are good memories for a specific application and did not really make to a general purpose memory. And that's what brought Surf Labs into uh, market. So the CRAM technology was incubated in Saram for five years. It was part of a DARPA funded program where we identified new materials that behaved similarly. Part of the job at ARM was to develop an IP portfolio and then develop research partnership. There was a business decision made somewhere in October 2020 to spin us out into a new independent company. And we have been live for one and a half years but the work or the the work that we did goes back even further out inside arm so the entire team that was working on CRAM ended up being part of the new company including our vp of research um, who is our ceo greg eric was a fellow at arm who is now our cto lucian Schifrin was the head of the Surf CRAM project inside Aram, and he's our VP of research and the rest of the technical team. So what do we do? We have a very different model than what you might know from semiconductor companies that are more popular. We do disruptive memory research, and I hope I convince you why memory is important. We develop uh, IP to support that research um, and we provide a lot of innovation on material engineering, on device engineering, physics, and some circuits and architecture. And eventually we transfer the technology to partners. So these partners could be big companies uh, who might need and uh, memory for the specific need. They can integrate our technology into their processes. So memory market is pretty big. Um, and it's usually divided into two aspects. There is an embedded memory market, there's a standalone memory market, uh, and it's expected to be about $300 billion by 2025. So what is interesting about CRAM is that it has this capability to go to a very general purpose memory, which is low cost, because it's very easy to make. It's just three levels of material it can be scaled to a very small dimension. So we can go to very advanced node, very low energy, fast operations and high endurance. But because we are going into this new physics paradigm, we also have very unique capabilities where the operation temperature could be extremely high and extremely low. So we have shown one Kelvin up to 200 Celsius. And that's just because it's limited by our testing setup. The memory is radiation hot too which is extremely useful for upcoming applications in space or defense, for example. And eventually the CRAM would look something like this. So you have a transistor, we'll still rely on the transistor, and then we'll have a, a CRAM as a two terminal switch. Um, and as you can see, we already have this kind of manufacturing of capability. All we need to do is just change the material that is being used at this layer. So it's going to be extremely cheap to manufacture and it can use the existing tools that are already present in the fabrication facilities. So what makes CRAM work? I did mention a bit, bit about carbon doping, but let's say I took a nickel oxide, that's one of our material, and I don't have a carbon doping. It turns out that the material is, without carbon doping, it would be an insulating material. It will start in this kind of low resist or, or high resistance state. And after a certain point, you start to see a breakdown or a soft breakdown. And this is how resistive filamentary memory works. But CRAM, we dope the carbon material, uh, dope the material with carbon, and we start the material in a low resistance state. So we have this black solid curve. And after applying a certain voltage and a current, it kind of switches abruptly from a low resistance state to a high resistance state. And if I continue going on this path, I can switch it back to a low resistance state. So this rocking curve, rocking chair mechanism uh, helps it to switch between two different states. 
So now that we have a technology, we did some research, we are trying to do a development of this technology. The, the question comes, how do we become a successful business? And that's where the part of the topic comes from is the innovation value of death. So innovation value of death is known as this transition where you start the development and you have to put a lot more money in as well as capital in to make it successful business. And not a lot of technology survive this uh, kind of value uh, because you need more appetite. Uh, for a hardware technology, it's very common to not see profits for a decade. Um, and at the same time, you have to do technology de-risking at every stage. And I have some experience of doing the left side of the things through my PhD at ARM, though I did, uh, sorry, PhD at Stanford, though I didn't really work on CRM. I understand how the research happens, partly driven by um, mostly government grants. On the other side, you have successful businesses uh, which already have a product. So most of the businesses that you know is have product that you can go and buy and they are making money out of it. But we are in a unique situation where we have a technology that is ready to be developed. It's not completely developed yet, but we need to show that the technology is successful as a new product and then sort of move towards a success business. Now, the trick to get out of this valley is to shorten this uh, width as much as possible. If you are long enough in the valley, like assuming you're traveling in a valley and if you're long enough, you get uh, deplete, deplete your resources and you end up dying. That's what we don't want in innovation. So you want to move fast enough, but at the same time, make sure that you de-risk the technology at each and every step to gradually move forward. The semiconductor valley looks slightly different. Um, it's a very general technology transfer valley, but for us, uh, we leverage government funding and university funding initially to develop a non-volatile switch, which has a very interesting properties. It is low voltage, it has deterministic switching, and it has extreme temperature operation. But we need to go towards this right side, which is a commercial memory. And that's when you get access to a lot of private sector funding. Uh, but for that, you need to show you have low cost, high yield, high density. And by high yield, high density, um, I really mean like very high yield. So in semiconductor, the yields are usually 99.999 percentage. And density is you need at least gigabits of memory arrays. So we need to somehow bridge this gap by showing that our technology can be manufactured in a state of the art facility. We can scale the technology. Right now we are making micron sized devices and we have shown some very small devices. Our process is repeatable. Um, and that's what, uh, when you translate a, a university technology to a commercial technology, you really need to focus on the repeatability because you want the technology to go to any part of the world and they should be able to make that thing work. Reliability and speed are, uh, primary concerns when you want to access to the private sector funding as well. So right now we have this various funding. For example, we use uh, DARPA funding to push the technology forward. And at the same time, there are some uh, like agencies out there that could potentially help you in the technology transfer direction. But most of the technology is outside this gap. Uh, most of the access to the technology is outside this gap. And why that matters is uh, when you do a university research, you are doing research on very small wafer coupons. So I don't know if anyone is from doing device work right now, but uh, we usually work with like inch by inch um, silicon. And we make like 10 devices and these devices are very large. Um, and on the other side, private sector wants to have very large wafers, so 300 mm wafers. Uh, but there is this niche of 200 mm wafers and that is not uh, easy to achieve because there's a, a barrier of capital investment. For example, let's look at the patterning tool. If I want to buy a patterning tool um, for a 300 mm wafer, it will cost me upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars. And that is not really accessible to a startup. And right now there are very few facilities that you can go and say, hey, I want to just do like patterning on one wafer or 10 wafer because I'm still in the development process. 
to achieve economy of scale, if you, at all you have to use a patterning tool, you have to make sure that you're using tens and thousands of wafers. So this is just one example, but there are all other tool set that you want to act, you want access to, but you don't really have access to. And this economy of scale really blocks a lot of microelectronic startup. And part of the reason is this happened partly because there was no need so far. Uh, we were in this really nice uh, environment where every few years the transistor was getting better and there was no need for new kind of technology. So no one really thought about bridging this gap uh, because everyone was happy that the, the electronics was getting faster, power efficient, cheaper. At the same time, the market was growing. So that was a very good thing for the private sector. But since this uh, bridge was never established, uh, if you want to, now we are in a situation where we want access to this new kind of technology and they're gonna face some problems. Long back for VCs, the most of the VCs went to software, uh, partly because it was not beneficial for them to invest in new hardware technologies and they could get much faster return from even lower investment in software. So a lot of VCs are skewed towards software as well. So there is this need where we need to fill that gap. So the way we are achieving this is by targeting, sort of spreading our uh, work into two aspects. So one is where we use facilities such as iMac to make sure that our technology is uh, compatible with state-of-the-art manufacturing facility because iMac has a decently enough large facility where they can mimic of what a big company or big fabrication facility to do work. And at the same time, we need to do some fundamental research to push this technolo technology forward. And we are working with UT Dallas um, to make sure that the, we can transfer this technology to them and sort of innovate on the way we make our transistors or make our devices, make our CRAM devices better. At the same time, we are working with other industries too, such as the quantum work that um, I mentioned initially is happening with in collaboration with UC Boulder. Um, and we have been successful so far to show this working proof. Um, our, our work at UC Boulder showed that the devices can operate till 1.5 Kelvin. Um, and we are working with DOE to sort of push that technology even forward. Um, we are also shown at UT Dallas that our CRAM can operate at 200 Celsius, and we are pushing that even further out and working with FRL as a phase two SBI grant to understand its implication in RF systems. And recently we got some results uh, showing uh, the radiation immunity to our devices. It was expected from the physics, all these things were expected from the physics, but we had to show, go out there and prove them on our wafers. And this opens us a beach head market. So even though I started talking about um, like bigger markets, which is the 300 billion market. Initially, we can start with simpler markets, such as uh, markets such as this hypersonic and electronics engine, where there is no alternative technology available yet um, that we can access. The other beachhead market is this quantum infrastructure market. Uh, and DOE is helping us to develop a cryogenic memory for this product. So you might have seen like the right top picture of a quantum chandelier, but what is not shown is that there's a lot of infrastructure that goes outside. Um, and you access your quantum computers or qubits through this large interconnects. Um, as a result, the access times are larger. These interconnects end up introducing thermal noise and error, uh, which is not good for quantum computer. In fact, that's the one thing that they're most struggling with right now. And it makes, your system not scalable. So uh, we are working on the development of cryogenic electronics at four Kelvin, which will help us to solve this problem. While I'm talking about this uh, beachhead markets, uh, we are also pushing the commercial memory development. So at iMac, we have shown uh, working 47 nanometer devices, uh, which can be driven by two, two fin, um, seven nanometer fin feds. This results in a very small 1T1 or bit cell area. Um, for example, our calculated bit cell area is about 0 0.014 micron square, which is significantly smaller than the 
the bid cells available in the market. Of course, our aim is to develop a commercial product. Um, and this is where we are now with the, with the green dot. Uh, our, uh, we, we sort of like put this together as a density versus the endurance kind of plot. Eventually we can, we, we, we want to go to higher endurance cycle, but that's sort of part of the development that we are ongoing. Our first target is uh, targeting flash and we are getting very close. Um, we are showing that the CRAM is much more scalable than flash uh, with much cost efficient fabrication and with much better uh, performance in terms of uh, your write speeds as well as the temperature range that we are having. Now, I, I said memory is just a transition. And if you read about what is happening in coated electron material, there are way more other options out there that could be accessed with correlated electron material. And we are only looking at this red circle of hysteretic memory. Once you understand these materials better, once we develop very uh, fab-friendly processes, it would be easy to translate that uh, knowledge to other aspects of the correlated electron material development. All right, so that was the introduction of market. That was introduction to what Surf Labs is doing. Why I'm talking about this, why I'm talking about this in terms of career growth. Um, the first aspect that just recently happened in last two years is the amount of interest, the public interest as well as financial interest, which has not been here in semiconductor for a long time. So just to give you an idea, right now, direct semiconductor jobs in US is around 280,000 and indirect are in millions. But just in next few years, because of the semiconductor manufacturing uh, onshoring, we are expected to add 70,000 new jobs, which is 25% improvement in just few years. And it's not just the, the investment from uh, government. There's a significant investment coming from all uh, big players, big and small players in semiconductor manufacturing. So it is a good time to be a part of or to enter this market. And because of the investment, it's gonna spread out evenly across the states in, in US and abroad too. Uh, we are already pretty well spread out uh, industry. And it's a misconception that most of the jobs are either available in West Coast or uh, very big cities. Even like smaller places are getting more and more um, job opportunities, which is very good because you can have different kind of lifestyle and still be part of the semiconductor industry. But I just want to caution because then this is my personal opinion. Um, the jobs are not going to be similar. Even though the new jobs are coming, they're not going to be similar, partly because uh, there are going to be significant innovation coming. And you saw in my motivation slide that we are really reaching a wall right now. And we need significant innovation across the stack in terms of different types of computing and whatnot. So 20, 30 years back, if you did a PhD in transistors and you were really an expert in transistors, you, you would be set for life. It would have been fine to keep that job, but I don't think that's gonna happen anymore um, because there is gonna be significant innovation happening and the least expectation from new engineers is gonna be to talking to your neighbors, to neighbors in your abstraction stack. So let's say you are a circuit person it would be useful for you to develop uh, yourself and the product if you talk to people from machine code or talk to people from materials and devices. And I, I really believe in this T and Pi model growth. It depends on what you really want, but having a depth is gonna be important because these problems are extremely complex, but at the same time, there would be more and more emphasis on talking to other people uh, it could be talking to same stack or across stack. If you are super talented, you could be expert in two fields. But if you're just doing a master's or PhD, you have already depth in one field, but you can develop the breadth. What I really mean by that is you really need to define your own career. Um, let's say you are good at semiconductor physics, um, and that's really good, and that will help you to access a lot more jobs than other people who are not good at semiconductor physics. But at the same time, you need to understand where your interests are. So one side, you can try to access more technical knowledge. 
So you could try to like access microarchitecture, try to understand what's happening in CS and AI ML. On the other side, you can access different kinds of technical expertise or you can access business expertise. That's just an example, but it's gonna be more and more important. And when I say semiconductor, don't really think about chips. There is whole industry that really supports semiconductor, one of them being automation. Automation could be robotics. It's gonna get bigger and bigger part of semiconductor. It could be learning code to uh, automate testing. It could be learning code to sort of finding out key statistics from the data that are being generated. So even like CS skills or embedded software skill to make these machines work um, in a very efficient environment are gonna be more and more crucial. So if you have a domain knowledge of semiconductor and if you get an, another skill, of embedded software, that's gonna be very interesting moving forward. There is also this trend that AI and ML is gonna continue, um, partly because there's a lot of data and data is garbage if you don't make insight out of it. Um, we have a lot of data being stored on our phone, a lot of data being captured, and there is this transition that is coming. Like for last 10 years, data was the oil, but eventually, we are going to have so much data, we don't know what to do with it. And the key will be, how do you make knowledge out of data? How do you make insights out of data? That's going to be key. And to achieve all that, semiconductors are going to be very important. Um, in the near term, for this, the, the packaging, uh, application-specific compute are going to be much more important than what we expect. And once we have new computing paradigm, like quantum or uh, neuromorphic computing, uh, that's going to even blow up how much we can do with the data that we already have. The other aspect that uh, I also feel strongly is that the application specific companies will increase. Um, so in terms of foundries, there are companies which make these chips, uh, but at the same time, there are companies who specifically use these chips. But like 10, 20 years back, uh, you would just go and buy off the shelf chips, but every company is getting interested in making application specific compute for themselves. So first of all, you need engineers to design those chips. You also need engineers to sort of talk to people who are gonna manufacture this chip. So there are gonna be new job opportunities where you have this domain knowledge of semiconductors, but at the same time, you have like experience in cars or you have experience in automotive self-driving and you could definitely bring up this niche where you leverage both of your expertise um, to enable new kind of chips for self-driving cars. And at the same time, I want you to look at bigger picture. Um, there are also like intermediate companies like ARM, Synopsys, uh, Surflab, which create IP, which create electronic um, software that supports all the design work that's happening around. And if you are from material science or if you are from chemi chemical industry or mechanical industry, there's a lot of infrastructure that's going to be needed to be built to enable the or, or to support the growth of semiconductor that we are seeing now. So it's a very, very diverse uh, skill set. And if you are smart enough, you can create a niche and be very successful in that business, which is where the T and the Pi model comes into picture. So that was the my summary. And I just wanted to leave it on like a very optimistic note. This is the slide I used for my PhD presentation and why I really uh, started working on semiconductor and why I'm really passionate about computing industry as a whole. So just look at what happened in the last 50 years. Uh, we had computer back in 70s, 80s, which could do really useful stuff. We sent man to moon in, <laughs> in 70s, that's crazy. Um, so if I just compare from Cray-1 in 1975 to an iPhone in 2017, we have been able to reduce the price by 10 raised to minus four, four orders of magnitude. And that make that's like the biggest democratic achievement. Um, the speed are faster. Uh, the same compute can be done with extremely low power and extremely lightweight. Um, if we can achieve that in last five years, I'm extremely optimistic that we can do much more in the next 50 years. Of course, there are challenges. There are challenges in terms of Moore's law being dead. There are challenges in terms of uh, increasing cost of uh, production. There are challenges that innovation is getting difficult, 
but I feel this is where you want to be. This is because challenges means opportunity. Um, and if you are really eager to learn, um, you can really create opportunity of these challenges. Um, so I will leave with that. Um, and I really thank you guys uh, spending time today talking to me or listening to me. Um, and if you want, you can reach out to me after this talk. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn or you can just message me on my email. But this is the time I want to look forward to. And I want to see if you guys have any questions, comments that we can talk about. Thank you so much. Great talk, Sarah. Uh, we do have a lot, uh, a few questions at least in the comments, uh, in the Zoom chat. Yeah, go ahead. I can't really see the chat. Oh, okay. oh. I can read them out. Okay. So Afzal is asking, uh, when roughly can we recover uh, up to greater than 90% levels from the effects of uh, chip shortage due to COVID? Uh, that's a billion dollar question. I, I, I'm in no position to answer that question, to be honest. But if you look at the market research, um, I would say at least end of 2023. Um, so we would probably reach the pre-COVID level earlier, but the growth has been so much after COVID a lot of things have moved online. Um, everyone is trying to invest in a better computer. Everyone is trying to invest in a better camera, better mobile phone, because the hybrid work is here to stay. So there's a significant growth. There's a growth of EV. So to match that growth, um, we will at least need till 2023. We might reach the same level before COVID earlier, but to match the, the demand, it might be much longer. But again, that's my perspective. That's what I've been reading. I'm no expert in this field of supply chain management. Okay. Thanks, Aura. The next question is from Tyler. I can he can I think Tyler can ask it himself. Do you want to, Tyler? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I was just wondering, because you were talking about the cost of production, these types of things. Uh, let's say that you guys were at scale on the manufacturing side. Do, are these CRAM chips, would they be projected to be about the same price as chips that you see on the market today from like Intel and NVIDIA? Or would they still be, or would they be more expensive, less expensive if you guys hit scale? So uh, the first order of answer is they would be cheaper because the way we expect them to be manufactured is much more easy. So to, to give that, let me go back to one figure here. I'm going to quickly jump to this figure. I'm going to compare the CRAM with something similar in the market. So look at this MRAM that you can potentially buy uh, in a few years. It's kind of getting complicated to make this chip, partly because uh, the requirements are so large. Um, and there are so many layers that you need to deposit to make one single MRAM. Uh, and if you compare to that, we only have three layers. So just by that, um, we would be cheaper. Um, and the cost really comes from how many number of layers you have, what kind of materials you use, uh, where in the supply, where in the semiconductor chain you are depositing this material and making these uh, chips. But I do expect it to be cheaper. Awesome. Uh, so that. Zayam asks this question, uh, what are the challenges you face with manufacturing of CRAM? For example, what's limiting higher memory density? All right. So I think uh, th those are two questions. What is limiting higher memory density and what are the challenges for any new technology, not just CRAM? So most of the time, innovation happens in the university lab or uh, industry lab where we use very simpler method to filter out materials. So in our case, we use a spin-on uh, technology where you basically take a wafer, put some material and then spin the wafer and it sort of spreads out the materials kind of most like most evenly, but not as much uh, accuracy that we would expect. And we can test these individual devices and like do a lot more uh, experiments faster. Now, when we want to go into an industry, um, we want to make sure that all the material that we use should be compatible with what industry is already doing. So you can't just introduce a new material um, abruptly because there is already so much things happening in industry um, that it might get contaminated. 
um, I didn't show that here, but recently that happened with uh, Kioxia, which is one of the memory manufacturing company. Um, they had a contamination in one of the material that they're using. And that affected like billions of dollars of uh, material or billions of dollars of product. So it's it's a very fine-tuned balance of how do you introduce that material into technology. Uh, for example, we are working with Beauty Dallas to use the fabrication facility as close to industry as possible. Um, and that will take time because you have to not just translate the material science, you have to translate the physics and everything together to a new kind of device. Um, in terms of the, the density of the memory, um, there are multiple reasons. Uh, the primary reason being that um, we are going, we are making transistors smaller and smaller. And the primary memory that is on your chip is known as SRAM. And SRAM, when you make it smaller, um, it doesn't really work because there are more errors being introduced. So the SRAM is going into the opposite direction. Uh, your transistor are getting smaller, but the minimum size of SRAM is actually getting bigger and bigger, at least in terms of the proportion. So right now, some of the chips have 50% of chip just consumed uh, by tens of megabits of SRAM uh, because the other aspect is going smaller. So it's not just by itself, the memory is not going sort of smaller, it's more like a relative. Uh, term because you want to progress towards a smaller technology node and memory has stalled. Uh, for example, the NAR flash has stalled at 45 nanometer, uh, which is a flash memory that goes on embedded chips because partly because you can't really go below that uh, dimension for multiple reasons. And one of them being that uh, in flash, you sort of like use electrons to store a charge. But if you go below 100 electrons, and you can't really control the electrons. So there is a lot of variation being introduced at that level, uh, which is not really good for a memory product. Um, so I hope that answer, but there are there are multiple threads why the memory is not getting smaller and smaller. Well, that was a great answer. Thank you so much and a, and a great talk. Um, I guess a little bit of background why I asked the question was that I, I work in a high throughput nano manufacturing systems, like technologies like nano imprint lithography and then also metrology for uh, like high throughput inline metrology for manufacturing. So the limiting factor isn't the ability to pattern and etch these features in, that are nano scale in large area applications. It's more fundamental limits with this, the physics of the devices that you're designing. Sorry, um, I, I didn't hear properly. Was that a question? Uh, I, was, I was saying, yeah. Is, so the limitation isn't related to the infrastructure around patterning and etching these features into like say a silicon substrate. It's more about the physics of the devices themselves. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, there are like three more questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, so our institute actually has a project in uh, conjunction with MIT and Department of Energy. It's called the Aerialis Project and they are trying to use self-assembling dialogue copolymers uh, and they claim that they can achieve um, sublithographic scales of resolution in patterning. Have you actually seen such things being used to design chips before? So block copolymer are not new. Um, like the literature goes back to like 20, 30 years back. Um, and I knew a few people who were working on block copolymers. Um, I think it's definitely promising. Um, one of the challenge um, to translate that technology from my perspective would be that uh, sometimes you need like a abrupt patterning, uh, especially for logic and block copolymer when you heat them or depending on what kind of technology are you using to align them, they do provide like a, a, a more continuous patterning. Um, but it might be suitable for memory. I'm not going to discount it completely. It might be suitable for memory, primarily because memory has much more uniform patterning than logic would enable. Um, but I would think that block copolymer is some like, still somewhere in the research phase, and they're going to go through similar transition where they have to gradually de-risk the technology, uh, make sure that the technology is compatible with state-of-the-art manufacturing. And again, uh, I think the, the previous person pointed out this uh, very vividly that it is not just making it smaller. Uh, I think that is one aspect um, to make it smaller and cheaper. 
but we are also limit like reaching this physical limit as well. So that should also be taken into account. Like, does a smaller dimension really help? Okay. Uh, uh, the next question is, uh, so since qubits were mentioned in the talk, is there an actual functioning device in industrial use that uses qubits or does do they not even exist? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so qubit unfortunately has been a little bit maligned because um, there was a lot of promise and it didn't deliver. There is definitely still promise. Technology is improving as we speak. Um, what would really enable benefit of qubit is what we call as noise-free qubit or error-free qubits. Right now, we are not there yet. Uh, a lot of the technology out there are extremely error prone. Um, and we are not even at that level where we can run error correction on this qubit. So you might hear about error correction, you might hear about error prone qubits, but we are not there. What we have right now is something called as quantum annealers in the market, um, where essentially you, you design a problem um, and some, some uh, people with the Monte Carlo background will probably know this, um, that you can design a problem and you let the, let the problem work it out itself. And then eventually you get like solutions and you average them out and you find like a ideal solution. Um, what we are moving towards is what we call as NISC uh, or like, I forgot the acronym, but it's basically error qubit. Uh, but the challenge right now is that the estimate are you need thousands of this qubit to make one qubit work. So there's a way where you can use like bad qubits um, to sort of simulate or to behave like a good qubit, but you need thousands of that. And if you read the literature, the best chips are like 50, 70 or 100 qubits. So we are far, far away from any kind of meaningful applications in qubit. So I, I just had a follow up on that, if, if that's okay. So- Yeah, yeah please go ahead. I, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we understand that the human brain um, has, has high error in this kind of traditional CS sense, right? But right. Uh, obviously the human brain is capable of great feats of computation. And so I guess that perspective uh, lends the question, is it, is it a problem with, with qubits and error rates and qubits or is it, an, is it an algorithmic perspective, right? Like, do we just not have the right algorithms to function with these kind of error tolerances? And I was curious uh, what your perspective was on that. I think it's it's on fundamental level. Um, the the algorithm that work like Schwartz algorithm and stuff they expect like a very good behaving qubit, but we don't have uh, like to that level of extent because there are efforts to make algorithm that would take into account. I wouldn't compare qubits to to human brain because the the function that human brain perform are very unique. Um, we are error prone, but our evolutionary mechanisms are way stronger. Uh, for example, we can't remember more than like seven to 10 things at a time, but we expect computers to do that. We are very good at uh, pattern recognition, uh, but at the same time, if you find something new, like there are optical illusions that could trick our brain too. So like human brain is good in certain things, especially keeping us alive. But when you really think about competition, um, on the type of competition we need, um, those are completely like different domain. Um, and I, I think qubit, like that, as, as I said, there are ways to make bad qubit work, but we are still not there yet. Yeah, so do you think that, cube, like, uh, I really appreciate your response. Uh, just one more follow up. So- Yeah, please, please, yeah, I have plenty of So it seems like what, what you're saying is that like for a lot of practical uses of, of, of computation today, uh, we can't have kind of the high error rate tolerances that the human brain has. But do you then think that like for more general kind of AGI type work, artificial general intelligence type work, then maybe the error rate faults won't be an issue? Um, or, or, or do you think that, I, I guess maybe that, that's too speculative of a question to um, so Asia is a little bit further out and I'm not even sure how quantum will affect the AGI and how that will turn out. Um, right now, like it, it may not be possible to directly uh, uh, translate the problems that we do like deep learning and um, reinforcement learning to quantum even now. 
So I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I really can't answer that question. It's um, unfortunately. Right, right. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I, I kind of realized that as I was asking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, the last question is, since uh, most of us are computational scientists, uh, okay. can you touch upon potential careers for people who don't really interact with the semiconductors research, but want to maybe work uh, from a computational side in the field? Yeah, yeah. I think there is going to be a huge competition. I should have touched that a little bit better in the robotics uh, when I talk about automation. So the the stack the 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 way the computers are designed today um, is is sort of like a local minima. Um, it's not very optimal the way things are being designed because what happens is that there is like a handoff between different abstraction levels, and that may not lead to a, a, a global minima um, in terms of what is the best way to design these ships, what are the most efficient way to design this ship. So there is a lot more work happening to sort of break this uh, abstraction level and competition comes into that picture. So there's a bunch of work done to use uh, AI driven algorithms to design your chips because the hope is that AI can translate across the stack very quickly than humans can um, and enable you a very good uh, uh, answer, like good optimum. Um, on the other side, there is a lot more need for computation in terms of uh, optical computational lithography. Um, so even today, a lot of like lithography that's being done is completely driven by computation. So there are computational engines which uh, translate the, the chip knowledge to the mask knowledge. And um, you can look at the mask that's been designed today. They're completely non-intuitive and everything is done with uh, a very uh, deep uh, understanding of uh, how the light flows. And especially I think competition is gonna be very interesting when we go to new paradigms uh, of competing, um, which may not be happening anytime soon. I would say I would put like 10, 15 years down the line, if at all. Uh, but if at all we move away from abstraction, like we need some tools to um, like get a grasp on design, get a grasp on um, like how do we make them? And that's where the, uh, the competition, like your uh, tools is gonna be, uh, optimization tools are gonna be very useful. Yeah, I hope that answers the question, but those are the things that come to my mind. Yeah, yeah, the, those are all the questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, um, one, one last question. Yes, uh, please go ahead. First of all, great talk. Uh, sorry, Thank I couldn't ask a question earlier. So, I, I remember you telling that you did try making the devices on nanometer scale, like de uh, demonstrate some of the devices on the nanometer scale and they seem to work fine. Right. So did you also check if like, if you did you see any cross talk? Uh, because that has been reported in some of the other uh, emerging technologies like RAM, that there's been a lot of cross talk when, yeah. when you make devices in nanometer scale, like when they're literally sitting right next to each other. Right, so, so that's the thing that we are working on right now. When we make these devices, um, even though it's like a small device, they're not next to each other. We in fact etch the devices which are closer to them um, to enable like the metal lithography, top and bottom electrode. So we have not gone to an extent to uh, study the crosstalk yet. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Good point, thanks. All right, any other questions, comments? No, just, yeah, thank you for taking the time to present thing to us. Yeah, thank you for inviting <laughs> me. I really appreciate talking to you guys. It was <laughs> fun. Yep. And if you have any other future comments, questions, feel, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Yep, the video right. of this talk will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So, okay. so yep. All, All right, right. have a good all. day, everyone, and thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Saurabh.